Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Additional factor, uh, which is very, very important in terms of economic outcomes. Yeah, well, hey, COVID-19, uh, or as uh, we like to refer to it here, uh, COVID-1984, uh, hey, I mean, when we go back to last September, we had the repo meltdown a year ago, last a year ago, almost to the day. And it was at that point where I knew something was drastically wrong, that we were headed for some major problems. And then COVID came along and it was like the perfect uh, straw man. Blame everything on COVID. Forget about the fact that, in my opinion, what I was thinking of was that a couple of big banks had failed or perhaps some hedge funds or a mixture. And then we found out that JP Morgan Chase just threw $125 billion of overnight lending from the repo market. And then, you know, it seemed to go away. The Fed just kept pumping in more and more money. And where are we today is the question. Well, it's, uh, I had exactly the same feelings uh, about uh, that crisis last September. It actually happened on the day when the sale of Deutsche Bank's prime brokerage to BNP uh, went through. And I thought it might be connected with that. But it also reminded me of a time back uh, before the Lehman crisis. I think it was um, around about uh, December 2007, we had a bank called Northern Rock, which was basically a, North, uh, a mortgage lender, which uh, was an extremely aggressive lender. I mean, they were lending at 125% loan to value. So <laughs> you can see um, how aggressive that was. They got into trouble. There was a run on the bank. Um, the Bank of England quietened everything down. But that December, I just happened to be in R.P. Martin's office. Now, in those days, R.P. Martin was a money broker. In other words, they um, would have bank customers, some of which had surplus funds at the end of the day, and others of which had a deficit of funds at the end of the day. And basically, they would broker between the surpluses and the deficits uh, to ensure that everybody came out um, straight. Uh, on that day that I was in that office, suddenly LIBOR seized up. There was no one offering any LIBOR money. And this created enormous difficulties. And I thought, this is serious. This is extremely serious. The following February, Northern Rock went under. Uh, it collapsed and had to be rescued by the government. So, yeah, I mean, you can't necessarily say that one thing is directly the consequence of another, but when you start smelling things happening which are bad in that sort of environment, it is best, firstly, to take notice, and secondly, assume the worst. And that was exactly the position I found myself. Um, last September, again, for the second time, when the repo, no, it wasn't, it was the... Um, uh, it, yes, it was the repo rate, which ro rocketed up to 10% before the Fed caught it. So, yeah, and that was the day in which a major prime brokerage changed hands between two European banks. Is this serious? I don't know. But you're right to say that this issue has now been covered up. Now, to a large degree, if that was the start of the banking crisis, it has been deferred by the Fed's actions by doing unlimited QE. And uh, that really started on March the 23rd. You had that announcement from the Fed, and that was um, 
the uh, Monday after the 16th, when they cut the Fed funds rate by 1% down to zero. They were in panic mode. They still are in panic mode. And I think that's very important. And also it is worth remembering that at that time, the uh, general consensus was that COVID lockdowns would be followed by a V-shaped recovery. In other words, we go way down and then we come back up and everything re returns to normal. That V-shaped recovery is no longer credible. It wasn't really at the time, but that was what everybody said. Now it is completely disproved as being an outcome. So where are we? We're printing limitless money. Um, if you look at the uh, US government's um, um, finances, in fact, in the year which is just ending now, um, September the 30th being the end of your fiscal year, according to the Congressional Budget Office, um, it is 3.3 trillion of uh, taxes, 3.3 trillion of um, debt finance, in other words, inflationary finance. So if you go back to um, that March, from that time when the deficit exploded, the US government is getting more of its money from the debasement of its currency than uh, from, uh, from taxes. And that is a very, very serious outcome. And really, you can't overstate that enough. Of, I don't know if you were familiar with this uh, cartoon show called South Park in the US, but uh, it's a satire. And one of the things, uh, South Park, uh, basically they cut off their credit lines and therefore the, the town just goes down the dumps. I mean, they have like what you would call a depression. And at that point, um, Stanley is trying to, I think if I have it right, uh, character, the hero, he's trying to return his father's uh, margarita maker because he can't afford the uh, interest payments on it. And he finds out that it's been securitized by a Wall Street bank. And he goes up to the bank to try to get a refund. So in any event, he goes up to the headquarters of this Wall Street bank where they're making all these multi-billion dollar decisions. And he sees that there is a round wheel with all sorts of different actions. And the way they decide what to do is they cut the head off of a chicken and the chicken runs around the wheel and wherever the chicken collapses, that's how they make the decision. And obviously it's a satire, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's really kind of uh, art imitating life because these guys don't really know what they're doing and they might as well be using an eight ball to make their decisions. In fact, you wonder if they are using an eight ball in Washington and in Wall Street. And then uh, Stanley's able to get a refund on the on the margarita maker and they up his, he gets an unlimited credit line on his American Express card and he comes back to the town and he basically, he becomes like a, a primary lender and he uses his unlimited credit card uh, limit to e allows everyone else to attach to his limit. And then South Park is saved because the credit spigots back on and everybody can keep spending. And, you know, it's a, uh, it's a little bit way out there, but in, in a, in a kind of twisted way, it's exactly what we're seeing now, minus the heads of, you know, dead chickens uh, bleeding all over and picking the next action. Are you sure about the chickens? Well, I tend to believe that, you know, they're a, they're a very genteel, seemly lot. They don't uh, go for, you know, animal uh, sacrifice, at least not in the office. Maybe <laughs> after work, animal sacrifice is okay. Maybe human sacrifice is uh, okay as well. But in the office, no. No. <laughs> I think the underlying point um, is that uh, the Fed actually has only one solution for everything, and that is just to print, 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 print. So the, the creation of yet new money, if you like, and sort of the point about the credit card um, is the only thing the Fed knows. And uh, if we are right, and that is that we should have listened to what was happening in the retail, in the repo market way back last September, a year ago, then that money printing has only just started.
And uh, the, the whole basis of the Fed's approach is to sustain uh, uh, a financial um, asset bubble. And at the center of the financial asset bubble is US Treasury debt. So long as the yield on US Treasury debt is kept down, the Fed believes it has a chance of being able to finance the US budget deficit without further consequences. Now, obviously, um, this is exactly the same policy that John Law followed, again, exactly, we've got lots of coincidences here, 300 years ago, when he inflated the Mississippi bubble. And he did that by printing money because he had the central bank. He, the central bank was his. The Banque Royale was appointed to be the currency issuer. So he printed money to buy shares in uh, the Mississippi venture and uh, to keep the price rising at a time when people were beginning to sell. And there was one man who uh, worked this out actually well ahead of the whole thing and never bought into the scheme. And that was Richard Cantillon, who happened to be a banker. And we know Cantillon in another um, uh, uh, sense, and that is the Cantillon effect, where he described how inflation spreads through an economy, um, giving advantage to the people who print the money compared with those who receive it. Now, Cantillon made his second fortune by deciding that the way to play the John Law bubble was not to sell the shares, but to sell the currency, to short the currency, which he did on the exchanges in London and Amsterdam in great quantity. And believe it or not, it was the currency that collapsed. The shares retained some sort of value. They fell from a high of around about 11,000 livre to a low of around about 3,000 livre. But having started on this decline at the beginning of 1720, by the time of October 1720, there was no value for the livre on the London exchanges. So it was the currency that collapsed. Now we have a situation where the central banks and particularly the Fed are pursuing exactly the same policy. They are printing money to support financial assets, particularly US Treasury debt. There will come a time when that policy fails and when it fails, it will be the currency that is destroyed. Now, obviously, if you hold US Treasury debt or any other bonds, fixed interest bonds, you're going to lose badly out of that. Of course you are. Equities, you may do better. But remember the lesson from uh, the Mississippi venture, and that is that the shares collapsed in a collapsing currency from 11,000 down to 3,000. So that is not a way out either. Property is quite a problem as well. I mean, I mean physical property because it is priced on the basis of the availability of mortgages. As you get a collapsing currency, obviously the interest rates start rising because nobody's going to lend you uh, money in a collapsing currency um, at 0% interest. They're going to want to get some sort of uh, comfort, if you like, in terms of uh, interest income. So that will have the marginal effect of collapsing property prices, not just uh, uh, residential, but commercial as well. At the end of the day, those prices will recover. But you can see that it's sort of, you know, it's got to go through the valley of the shadow of death before you come out of it. A collapse in currency is an extremely serious thing. And I just see too many um, uh, similarities between what John Law did and understanding why it collapsed uh, to ignore what's going on uh, at the Fed at the moment and their policy of inflating or keeping inflated financial assets. It, well, you know, we've had a pretty good run here, Alistair, uh, over 200 years on the dollar, where the first dollar ever printed is still, uh, can still be used, even though you'd be a lot of money based on the collectability of that original banknote, whatever it might be, treasury note, I guess. Uh, it's probably worth 10 times its face value as a collector, collector's item. But uh, 
On the other hand, we've got people saying, well, while all this money is being created, we've got lots of money being destroyed because there's loans that can't be paid back. There's trillions of dollars in municipal bonds and trillions of dollars in all sorts of corporate loans that won't be able to be paid back, mortgages that won't. So is inflation the way or do we wind up deflating or do we inflate first and then deflate? I'm just curious about your opinion there. Well, um, first of all, let's define the, uh, inflation. Inflation is an expansion of the quantity of money. Uh, the rise in prices is the effect of it. Um, lots of people tell me that the advantage of inflation is that you reduce the true value of any outstanding debt. Now, that is true. But for a government, it also increases the cost of future, um, if you like, the net present value of future commitments. Just imagine uh, what um, future unemployment benefits would have to be to keep any sort of body and soul together in a currency collapse. Just imagine what happens to all the pensions that people will have lost out on. Just imagine what happens to all government expenditure. How are they going to replace it? The answer is they can't. So when you get an inflationary collapse, basically the government is bust and it can no longer function as a redistributor of money around the economy. It can no longer function um, as, um, you know, as an independent entity from its people uh, because it cannot pay anyone. It has nothing to pay anyone with. So it needs to stabilize the currency. And this was exactly the situation which Germany found itself in, in November 1923, when it fixed the paper mark to the gold mark in the ratio of a trillion to one. That was how much. The paper mark and the gold mark were at parity until July 2014. The, that was then suspended. The exchangeability between the two was, was then suspended. And by 1923, the end of 1923, it was a trillion to one. That's what happens. Just imagine what happens to government finances in that situation. And you have an idea of the destruction that it wreaks on government as well as the people. Yeah, well, they said, uh, I think it was Keynes said, uh, no other way uh, to bring about social revolution than uh, to debase the currency and to debase it to the point where, where it's valueless. So we could be looking at major chaos and social unrest. How are the police going to get paid? How are the firemen going to get paid? The military, all of this, uh, what's going to be, you know, they're going to have to try something. What are they going to try to, to staunch the flow? Well, I've seen this before in Africa. Um, basically, it hasn't been a hyperinflation in African countries, with the exception of Zimbabwe. But in a country like Kenya, where I spent my childhood, we left an extremely good police force and we had a stable currency. After independence, the purchasing power of the Kenyan shilling went down and down and down. I don't know what the rate is to the pound is now. It's something like 40,000 or something. It's been a gradual decline. But obviously, the wages of people like police have not kept pace. So what do the police do? They do their private enterprise thing. You know, they basically um, you know, stop people in the street, find them, they take bribes. That is the way in which they maintain some sort of standard of living for themselves. So you rapidly descend into an economy which becomes corruption-based. Yeah. And uh, like in Cuba, uh, I always say the real economy is the black market, not the government. Uh, they have two different currencies, and I don't remember what they are. One is, uh, I can't remember, the peso, and the other is called the... Uh, I uh, can't remember. Kook. Yeah. Kook, Cuban something currency. They call them kooks, C-U-Cs. And people aren't allowed to have the kooks, but they manage to get them anyway. But they would be much preferring to have the dollar rather than the kooks, at least for this point now. So I guess uh, kind of get into some type of Cuban thing I mean, crime is bad now, social unrest is bad now, if what you're saying comes to pass, 
we'll have complete anarchy. I'm afraid so. And uh, we, we, the comparison, if you like, with uh, Germany in 1923, there is one big difference, and that is that in 1923, there were stable foreign currencies which circulated in Germany, and business uh, towards the end of the inflation basically made sure that prices were fixed in an adjustable um, way. In other words, the, the rate was fixed. So if the rate at that particular moment was 100,000 paper marks to the uh, gold mark, um, that, was the, the, that was the rate that was fixed in the contract. So if the paper mark went down further, the business didn't have um, that problem. Uh, so you can see that there are ways in which this situation can be handled. However, this time we have a real problem with the dollar, as I described the John Law uh, simile, uh, and uh, that is the major currency. We have no gold-backed fiat currencies in the world at the moment, and consequently, there is no escape from a collapsing dollar, and everything will go with it. Of course, people tell me that um, there will be a reset. There is a, a, a widespread expectation that there will have to be a currency reset. But that presupposes that government actually knows what it's doing. I'm sorry, governments all around the world and their central bankers have no idea of what they have unleashed by this infinite money printing. Well, it's definitely cause for concern. I guess uh, I fall back on the thing. The situation is always hopeless, but never serious. This sounds pretty serious, Alistair. I think it's pretty serious. And I think it's important that uh, all our friends uh, prepare themselves for it. And the only way in which you can do that is to have some sound money under your belt uh, for those very difficult times. Um, I'd strongly recommend that. I'm not giving investment advice. I'm giving money advice. <laughs> obviously, the sound money is gold and silver. Obviously, and we've seen them make quite a move. They had a little pullback over the past couple of weeks. Looks like that's coming to an end rather quickly. But uh, what about cryptocurrencies? What's your take? Are they going to survive this? Um, it's a difficult one. That um, There is no doubt that there is a movement um, under cryptocurrencies, which is pushing them better all the time. Um, uh, well, more or less all the time. There is a belief that Bitcoin, if you like, can operate as a new monetary standard. And this is purely on the basis that um, the uh, issuance of new Bitcoin is um, is known in advance, and it is very strictly limited. Um, quite a lot of Bitcoin aren't in circulation, like they might have been lost, if you like, in the early days. So, um, you know, just looking at it from that point of view as a store of value, there is an argument that can push it higher. However, the world actually works on gold and silver as the people's money, not an electronic invention. And when we return to gold and silver, the question then is, how will Bitcoin be priced in gold and silver? I think at that stage, it will be merely exposed as a very speculative counter. But having said that, there's probably a long way to go in, in uh, uh, sound, relatively sound uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, because everybody's got a mobile phone. Um, you know, they can buy and sell the things on a mobile phone. I mean, you know, the, the, the potential for a Bitcoin bubble, I think, is absolutely enormous. But I, at the end of the day, I come up with this problem. How are you going to price Bitcoin in gold? What is the point of pricing Bitcoin in gold? Probably none at all. With gold, you can do your transactions. You could change things so that um, uh, you know gold backs your um, your Visa card, your debit card, whatever. I mean that can all happen. The technology is there to do it, but the ability to do billions of transactions a second in a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin is just not there. So it would fail, I think, at that stage as money. All right, and it's never really been money. It's uh some kind of hybrid asset, we'll call it that. It's not money, obviously. A, a store of value, maybe, is about all you can say, I think, at this stage, yes. Perhaps, and that remains yet to be seen. So obviously, gold money is a place to go. 
getting physical bullion, various funds that are out there, what's going to happen in a place like Canada if the the loony becomes worthless? Are they just going to sit back and let uh, Eric Sprott have this huge stack of metal and uh, not come calling and expropriate it? Well, we're going to be we're really down to the question of property rights. And uh, Canada is actually pretty good on property rights as such. I mean, you know, they may tax you to death, but um, uh, they would. They, I think I think um, they are unlikely to actually, uh, if you like, physically take property. Um, and, uh, you know, people like Eric, um, you know, if if uh, that is what the Canadians decide to do, then he just gets on a plane and says goodbye. This is the problem. You cannot rob people of their wealth if they have a lot of wealth and expect to achieve anything. And people just go. I mean, in the UK, our richest man, who's a chap called Radcliffe, um, uh, has uh, decided that he's decamping down to Monaco. So he's gone to Monaco. And according to a newspaper I read, um, Her, Her Majesty's Inspector of Taxes is losing uh, four billion in tax. Just one, one man, bang, like that. So, you know, this it, this is a lesson, if you like. And this, I think, in a sense, is why uh, governments at the moment are reluctant to increase taxes, because they realize the economic effect uh, would be extremely negative. So um, what are they doing? They're printing money instead. That's another reason why it's print, 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 print. Hey, and in New York City, we're seeing exactly the same thing. People leaving the city have been for decades now because of overtaxation, confiscatory taxation rates. And now they're leaving because of social unrest and spiraling crime rates. So they're coming to places like Florida, like Texas, and other states that, uh, that they perceive to be safer. And these states have had like a major shot in the arm. What they're going to do with these uh, states as they fail you know, we're going to have uh, 35, 40 failing states, and that's uh, that's a scary thing to think of. Well, it's an extension, if you like, of uh, the failure of government. Um, you know, whether it's central or whether it's local, I'm afraid failure is failure. And the failure in government are uh, kissing cousins. They go hand in hand. Eventually, every government program, every government system, it all fails. So. Your only hope is precious metals. You guys in uh, the UK can't even go out and buy guns. At least here in the US, that's still possible, but you have to get on a waiting line. Pretty soon they'll be rationing guns and ammo, if they're not already. But the free market is the ultimate uh, rationing device. We've got free prices on ammo and guns. So they're going up as companies making more money and people are paying more Another case of uh, firearm inflation, ammo inflation in the United States, prices going up. Well, you've given us a lot to chew over here, Alistair. Uh, hey, where's the best place to go read your work and uh, latest articles? Yep, yeah, uh, goldmoney.com. Um, I publish an article every Thursday under the research stroke insights um, tab. And uh, the other thing I do is I do a market report on gold and silver every Friday. So, so those are the those are my two my two moments, if you like, uh, Thursday for the insight and Friday for the market report. OK, and uh, if you sign up for the mailing list, they send uh, Alistair's article to you like clockwork every week. I get it. Highly recommend it. Any questions or comments? Why don't you email us? KL at KerryLutz.com. Make sure you go over to the website, FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Sign up for your free newsletter. Alistair, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Uh, hopefully the, the uh, scenario that you're spelling out isn't as bad as it would appear to be, but never, uh, never put it past government to screw up in the worst possible way. I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I sincerely do. All right, me too. Thanks, Alistair.